Welcome to the Council of Trend Podcast, a production of Catholic Answers. It's Free For All Friday here on the Council of Trend Podcast. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, we talk about theology, apologetics, how to explain and defend the Catholic faith. But on Friday, we talk about things that I just find to be interesting. And a few weeks ago, I was at home and I had nostalgia. So I went online and I found a program where you could play the old Oregon Trail video game. And so I played it. I had my wife play it. We compared our stats and our scores. And I thought, why not talk about the game Oregon Trail and then the real life Oregon Trail, how to beat these two things here today on the Council of Trent podcast. So welcome. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. First, we'll talk about the game, and then we'll talk about the real life historical ventures that were based on the game and separating truth from fiction from what you used to play in your computer lab at middle school. Now, I remember going to my middle school, my junior high in Phoenix, Arizona, and I would go into the computer lab at lunchtime to play games. And then also we would just have computer lab time during our classes. And there were three games that I would play on the old Apple computers. So number three was Where in the World is Garmin San Diego? Now, I think that was the theme song for the TV show, but I remember playing the computer game, trying to find Carmen San Diego, and I knew my geography backwards and forwards. So I was pretty good about tracking her down. Number two was Sim City. And so with Sim City, I always did the password. Did you do this as a kid in your computer lab? You would get Sim City, but you asked the other kids, what was the password to get unlimited money? And then I would just get that, have unlimited money, build up a huge city, put like 10 nuclear reactors next to each other, like You'd have a school surrounded by coal power plants and other stuff that didn't make sense, and then send in the tornadoes and the giant robots to destroy the city. Because why not? You're 12 years old. But the number one game that I would play all the time in the computer lab in my junior high was Oregon Trail. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. First, to cue your nostalgia goggles, do you remember this tune when you would start the game? Of course, that's the sound when you leave Independence, Missouri, just like the real Oregon Trail pioneers and their covered wagons would leave Independence, Missouri. And so you would get there and decide when you would leave, what profession you would have, and what supplies you would take with you. Now, to put it all into context, here's the real story of the Oregon Trail. So the Oregon Trail is a 2,170-mile historic east-west large wheeled wagon route and emigrant trail that connected the Missouri River to valleys in Oregon. The eastern part of the Oregon Trail spanned part of the future state of Kansas and nearly all of what are now the states of Nebraska and Wyoming. That was the eastern part of the trail. Then you'd cross over through the Rockies and you'd have the western half, which included the future states of Idaho and Oregon. So how did the Oregon Trail get started? Well, it started at the beginning of the 19th century. Between 1811 and 1840, this trail going from Midwest America all the way almost to the east coast of America and the Pacific Northwest, it was a trail that was laid by fur traders and trappers, so people that would go out west to try to get animal furs and skins and get that to sell at forts and other settlements in the western part of the United States. They laid this trail going from from about 1811 to 1840. By 1836, the first migrant wagon train was organized in Independence, Missouri, and a wagon trail had been cleared to Fort Hall, Idaho. So prior to this point, the Oregon Trail, you could only get there on horseback or by foot. Finally, in the middle, by the mid part of the 19th century, you could get a full on wagon train to go out to Fort Hall, Idaho. And then later, wagon trails were cleared to the Willamette Valley in Oregon, and the whole route was called the Oregon Trail. Then, as the years went on in the you know, 1840 to the later 1850s, you had a lot more expansion to the trails. So you had bridges that were added, cutoffs, ferries. Uh, which weren't always reliable. They weren't reliable in the game, that was for sure. Don't worry. There'll be plenty of griping on the Oregon Trail game coming here very soon. Uh, Other safe elements were put into place, roads, uh, other guides uh, that were along the way. Even stores would pop up along the trail to be able to service these huge wagon trains that would be going through. And even today, you can still see parts of the Oregon Trail. You can even navigate it today, like the the ruts that these wagons uh, would plow through. It 
it served as actually a reliable guide for people who were traveling the Oregon Trail to make their way all the way west. I mean, you think about it today, right? When we try to get anywhere, we're reliant upon GPS on our phones. Before we had GPS on our phones, we had to print out MapQuest and we would print it all out and take it with us. Imagine trying to cross the country uh, with none of those modern navigation devices. And yet when you study the Oregon Trail, you see that actually you'd have to be a really huge moron to get lost on the Oregon Trail. But at its height, uh, there were thousands of, uh, of immigrant families and wagon trains going down at these huge wagon trains that would leave these huge ruts in the road that you would follow. So if you just followed the wagon paths, you really couldn't get lost. You had to make a colossally bad decision like a very famous party in the Oregon Trail did that we'll talk about later in order to end up getting lost. And you can still follow the route today. Uh, there is an audiobook. Oh, sorry, it's a book, but you can also listen to it as an audiobook, which is really entertaining, called The Oregon Trail, A New American Journey by Rinker Buck. And so Buck actually hired a mule team in a wagon and went down the actual Oregon Trail himself just a few years ago. And he wrote about it in this book and it has very uh, poetic language, wonderful descriptions of scenes. Uh, so I would definitely recommend the audiobook version of it, but even reading it would still be enjoyable. The book is called The Oregon Trail by Rinker Buck. And so that was essentially the Oregon Trail, and it was popular up until the late 1850s into the 1860s, but the use of the trail began to decline in the middle to latter part of the 19th century because of the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, so if you think about it, would you rather be on a wagon train that could take several months to get you to Oregon, or would you rather ride on a train that could get you there in a few weeks a whole lot safer. So once the Transcontinental Railroad began to expand across the United States, people for, would, ended up foregoing the use of covered wagons, which was a, a difficult and dangerous journey. As you remember, of course, when you used to play Oregon Trail, right? You would play it and your friend Janie died of cholera. Your wagon caught on fire. You attempted to ford the river and the, the oxen drowned. Uh, now, there's one thing I remember about Oregon Trail is it taught me about the futility of trying to make your way in life, of trying to escape from divine providence. You may have your plans, but God has another plan in store for you, and it may involve your wagon tipping over because you didn't hire a Native American guide. You tried to cock the wagon and float it across the river uh, to no avail. You know, you'd have the best laid plans of mice and men go up in flames or cholera or dysentery on the Oregon Trail. That's what the Oregon Trail taught me, I guess, as a junior high student, is that death is always lurking around the corner ready to get you and your wagon train. Although every now and then what lurked around the corner were finding wild berries that would give you an extra 20 pounds of food and save you from starvation. So sometimes you had good luck, sometimes you had bad luck. So let's then talk about the Oregon Trail, the game. I'm sure you remember it, or you have kids that used to play the game. According to this article, the Oregon Trail is a computer game developed by the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium. So when you load up the game, you always saw that logo, M-E-C-C. -C. That was the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium. They first released the game in 1985 for the Apple II. It was designed to teach students about the realities of 19th century pioneer life on the Oregon Trail. In the game, the player assumes the role of a wagon leader guiding a party of settlers from Independence, Missouri to Oregon's Willamette Valley via a covered wagon in 1848. The game was designed and created by a team at MECC led by R. Philip Bouchard, who also served as the principal designer. It was loosely based on an earlier text-based game, also named The Oregon Trail, developed by Don Rawich, Bill Heineman, and Paul Dillenberger in 1971. So the, the original, original Oregon Trail was developed by, I think they were history teachers, actually, in the early 1970s. And it was a text-to-type game, so you didn't have the little graphics of watching the little oxen and the wagon moving along. You didn't have that. The graphic element was created by the MECC for the Apple II, and that debuted in 1985. But you could play a text-based game, and that was actually very popular for computer games back in like the 1970s and 80s. It didn't have visual, they wouldn't have visual graphics. You didn't have pictures of things. You would just have text like, you enter the wizard's dungeon. Do you pick up the sword or the key? You picked up the sword and were attacked by a gargoyle. And so it was usually a lot of these text-based games that were popular in the 70s and the 80s. But as computer graphics were able to expand and get better, when you had 
systems like Apple, Atari, the Commodore, uh, the Famicom from Japan, the Family Entertainment Console, aka the, the Famicom or the Super Famicom from Japan. Then you had processors more powerful enough to give you these visual elements. And that's what you remember from the Oregon Trail, of course, are the visual elements of watching the wagon slowly moving as the screen, the wagon stays in the same place, the screen moves past it, and you see the scenery and it has the cut scenes, and then you make your decisions based Based on it. So, all right. So that's our background in the Oregon Trail. How do you beat Oregon Trail the game? So remember, you are one wagon leader. Your goal is to get you and four other people. So you always type in their names, right? And you would type in the names of your friends to laugh, like you know, uh, who what's a what's a friend I had in middle school? You know, Tyler died of dysentery. You're dead, Tyler. Shut up, Trent. You're still dead, man. Uh, so you'd have your four friends in there, and your goal to get the most points is to get the five of you health in good health all the way to the Willamette Valley. That's your goal. And so when you start the game, what you choose to start with really does change how the game ends up for you. And that was the same for real life Oregon Trail as well. So the big things that you were able to do were the time of year that you left on the Oregon Trail and the profession that you chose, whether you were a banker, a carpenter, or a farmer, that would really change uh, how your Oregon Trail journey went. So when you would decide to leave, you could leave any time between, I think it was like March and July. And so you want to leave earlier, but not too early. So if you left in April, you ended up doing pretty well. Uh, for fun, the other time I was playing the game a lot, I decided to leave in July and I was the only one who survived and made it to Oregon. Because if you leave in July, what happens to you is by the time you get to the Rocky Mountains and you almost are in Oregon, you're in the Rocky Mountains during winter. And so you get messages like severe blizzard delayed by 10 days, lost for five days in blizzard, trail impassable. And then you end up eating your food and people get a lot sicker because it's cold. And that is what would happen to people in real life who either left too late or were delayed as they were moving across the country and would try to cross either the Sierra Nevada or other parts of the Rocky Mountains and would hit bad weather and snow. Uh, not good things happen to them. So you don't want to leave too late. Uh, you don't want to leave too early because spring uh, snowfall could cause the rivers to be too high and then your oxen drown. So you want to pick the sweet spot. I would usually pick April to try to beat the game. Next up, the big thing that would change how you did in the game was what profession you chose. You could be a banker, carpenter, or a farmer. And usually that dealt with the amount of money you had. Banker got 1600 bucks to work with when you bought in Independence, Missouri at the store. Carpenter got $800. The farmer only had $400. Uh, now, I played the game a few weeks ago, and I beat it with the farmer and got everyone there safely and in good health to the Willamette Valley. And the way to rack up points on Oregon Trail is that if you are a carpenter, your points are doubled at the end of the game. And if you're a farmer, your points are tripled, actually. So that's the key there. Your, your end score is based on the number of supplies that you have. But really, it's the number of people. If you get five people there in good health and you're the farmer, you're going to rack up a bunch of points. But it's hard because you only have $400. And once you leave independence, you got to buy the oxen, you got to buy the clothes, you have to buy all this stuff. You don't have any money for food. So what I did, what I would do and recommend is just buy bullets and go out and go hunting and stock up on food from Buffalo you would shoot on the prairie. Now, the game is smart. I'm telling you the game is smart. It knows when you're trying to beat the system in this way, and it saddles you with bad luck to try to even the score. I was playing the game once, and I thought I was so clever. I bought a bunch of bullets. I shot up a 1,000 pounds of food and was like, ha, I didn't have to buy any of this food. I saved myself like 20 cents a pound. I saved $200 on the food. And then like 20 seconds later, I get a message, your wagon caught on fire, lost 900 pounds of food, uh, nine boxes of bullets, and Tyler died. You're dead, Tyler. So that's what the game would do to you. Uh, and then when it came to hunting, by the way, sometimes the hunting you would do really well. You could find buffalo, which were you know 1,200 pounds of meat running really slowly. You would shoot them. But then you always got the message, right? You shot 3,000 pounds of food. You were only able to bring 100 pounds back to the wagon. And so that was always frustrating. But it was especially frustrating when you would go out to hunt with the game. You'd be the little hunting guy and you would be stuck in places like it would spawn you and you could turn in one of four directions and press the space bar to shoot your gun. But you'd always end up spawning in an area where there were rocks and trees you somehow couldn't walk around. And that buffalo or that bear would be right out of reach and you wouldn't be able to get them. 
Uh, but I will tell you this, the most nerve wracking part of Oregon Trail for me in the entire game were crossing the rivers. Even now when I play it with my wife or I'll play it next to her and we'll see who does better. When we start crossing the river and the blue fills the screen entirely so your wagon train is going and then the screen slowly gets more and more blue to show you getting in the middle of the river. When it's completely blue, my heart stops because that was always the moment when you knew that you passed the river just fine or disaster and a calamity struck. When it was completely blue, you would see the water either rise up and go over the oxen if you tried to ford the river or you would see the wagon tip over. You're like, oh no, when the wagon would tip over in the river, oh, you always lost so much stuff and you usually lost somebody in the process. So that was easily to me the most nerve wracking part of the game. Uh, The funnest part of the game to me though is when you got to the end, you had a choice. You could either continue another hundred miles down the trail or you could raft down the river to the Willamette Valley to get to the end. And I always chose rafting because it wasn't that hard. Another hundred miles on the trail, something is going to happen. Someone's going to get bitten by a snake. And usually I'm pretty good. I can steer the raft. And Laura actually did a good job. She she picked that route and she said, I didn't know I'd have to steer down the river. She's like, please help me. I said, no way, man. You're going to do it yourself. And she's there with the arrow keys. She's like, uh, uh. And she did it. She beat the game and got a, got a pretty high score. So my wife is the master of those old Apple II computer games. All right. So now that is the game. That's how you, some tips to help you to beat the virtual Oregon Trail. Uh, how is the game, though, different from the real life Oregon Trail? Uh, well, one thing at the beginning of the game, you'd always buy oxen in Independence, Missouri. I recommend three yoke of oxen, two oxen to a yoke. Uh, not every wagon train actually used oxen. Some of them were carried by hand carts that actually the pioneers themselves would pull. They would pull it themselves to be able to go down the trail. But that was really exhausting. So most people would choose oxen. Uh, unlike mules or horses, uh, oxen were actually really good to, to take along on the trail because they're less likely to be stolen. I mean, if you think about it, if you use horses and you tie up your horses at the end of the night, if a thief comes in the night, oh, this always happened to me. A thief would always come in the night and steal like 12 pairs of clothes. I'm like, come on, man. I'm still 100 miles away from Fort Idaho, Fort Boise. Did you really have to do that? If a thief comes in the knife night, he could take one horse put a rope around, you know, grab the reins of the other horses and just kind of ride off into the sunset. It's easy to ride off on a horse, right? Or to take a horse alongside you to be able to ride off with them. Or if you're riding, you have one person on the back of your horse, he steals the other horses. If you have oxen, it's a lot more difficult to steal oxen. So they were a lot more reliable when it came to taking people across the trail. But they weren't always. Some people used horses or mules, uh, and some people even used hand carts, which would have been uh, just awful. Another thing, though, about the oxen pulling the wagons, you might think it might be easy to just ride inside of the wagons, but most people hated it. I mean, this is not the interstate. This is not smooth asphalt roads. These are ruts in dirt that mud has formed over time. They would have been really bumpy, and so people got motion sickness and would feel terrible riding inside of the wagons. So a lot of people chose to walk alongside the wagons rather than ride inside them uh, during the Oregon Trail. Another misconception would be hunting. So you remember, my strategy in the game is just to go out, and I did this as a farmer, and it did work well most of the time. I would just buy bullets, because you would spend maybe 10% of the money you would have spent on food, a tenth of that would get you bullets to shoot enough food and you would just be you would be fine. But on the Oregon Trail, hunting wasn't a great option. First, later on in the history of the Oregon Trail, a lot of the game had been overhunted. You saw uh, bison being wiped out in the plains, uh, buffalo being wiped out. There wasn't a lot of game for people to hunt. There were thousands of these wagon trains going west. And it's all just along this this single trail. So you aren't going to spend a lot of time going days and days off the trail to be able to hunt. So a lot of the game got overhunted. But even if it didn't, if you try to go off trail to hunt things, you're more likely to get lost or injured. You were bitten by a snake. So hunting was something you would still do, obviously, in order to make ends meet. But most of these wagon trains tried to bring enough food for the journey. And it was not that pleasant. You had flour, you had cornstarch, you had beans, but it was just enough to be able to get you by. Another thing that um, you wouldn't have seen on the Oregon Trail were headstones. So you remember you would play the old Apple II game, and it would say to you at one point, there is a headstone at the side of the trail. Do you want to view it? Y, N, you know, yes, no. Here lies pepperoni pizza. 
ha, ha, ha. Uh, but in all reality, a lot of people tragically did lose their lives along the Oregon Trail. And you wouldn't have a headstone, right? You wouldn't make a headstone. And people didn't go back and put up headstones for people. Usually they would dig them with a shallow grave. They would put heavy rocks on top of the grave to keep animals from digging up the body. The only thing that would have been left there, you might have taken wood from the side of the road, from trees, or leftover timber from the carts, and made a cross to be able to put in the ground. But there were no tombstones that said, here lies pepperoni pizza, because there were hardly any tombstones along the journey. Uh, Though some people did have them, there's some places where you have memorials, and one that's the most famous would be for the most famous uh, Oregon Trail party that had the the worst luck. And that, of course, would be the Donner Party. So who were the Donner Party? Well, here's a great explanation from the 1980 horror film The Shining. uh, That Of course, you know, The Shining, starring Jack Nicholson, Shelley Duvall, and Danny Lloyd as a kid. It's about a caretaker who is hired to go take care of a hotel and ends up losing his mind and going after his family. And early on, you get to see that there might not be something quite right uh, in Jack, uh, the caretaker, who is played wonderfully by Jack Nicholson. That's kind of weird. Does he always play characters that end up having his first name? Because Jack Nicholson plays Jack in The Shining, and in the 1989 Batman movie, he plays Jack Napier, who would later be the Joker. So... I don't know, it might just be a coincidence there. But here he is explaining to his kid uh, what the Donner Party was. What was the Donner Party? They were a party of settlers in covered wagon times. They got snowbound one winter in the mountains. They had to resort to cannibalism in order to stay alive. You mean they ate each other up? Huh? They had to. In order to survive. Jack, don't worry, Mom. I know all about cannibalism. I saw it on TV. See? It's okay. I saw it on the television. So in that scene, actually, when Jack Nicholson says, See? It's okay. He saw it on the television. Uh, it wasn't quite a great Jack Nicholson impersonation, but when you watch the scene, his eyebrows do a wonderful inversion, and he has this grin like you see the early seeds of psychosis right there. But speaking, of course, of psychosis and things driving you crazy, that would, of course, be the sad, tragic story of the Donner Party, also known as the Donner Reed Party. Uh, so the Donner Party was a group of American pioneers who migrated to California in a wagon train uh, from the Midwest. Delayed by a series of mishaps, they spent the winter of 1846 to 1847 snowbound in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. So what happened with the Donner Party? Well, they departed from Missouri on the Oregon Trail in the spring of 1846 behind a lot of other families. And these wagon trains, they would end up eventually having hundreds of people in them. So when you play Oregon Trail, it makes it seem like it's just you out on the trail all by yourself in your little wagon train with your four other people. Like like you all just hopped in your sedan and decided to drive across country. No, there's strength in numbers. These wagon trains would end up having sometimes hundreds of people in them and they would be very very long and you had a lot of people to get supplies from to work together strengthen numbers to protect yourselves from bandits or interactions with native indigenous populations that may not have gone as well so they were heading out in the spring of 1846 the journey usually took four to six months but the donner party was slowed after electing to follow a new route called the hastings cutoff which bypassed established trails and instead crossed the Rocky Mountains, Wasatch Range, and the Great Salt Lake Desert in present-day Utah. So the big mistake, of course, that the Donner Party made was they took a new route instead of just staying on the established Oregon Trail. That is one of my number one rules when it comes to driving across country. Always stay on the interstate. You remember there's that older film that was remade a few years ago, The Hills Have Eyes. I think it's a Wes Craven film. The Hills Have Eyes is about a family. They leave the interstate, try to take a shortcut, and what happens to them? They end up breaking down. Well, they're purposely broken down. They're sabotaged and kidnapped by a bunch of mutants who live in the hills and want to cannibalize them and eat them. Uh, It's a great horror film. But the rule, and there's a great scene in it where the dad is trying to go and get help. One of the characters is trying to get help, and he goes, and he sees this huge desert flatland 
with all of these abandoned vehicles. And it's all the other families who broke down there because the mutants sabotaged the road, put uh, chains along it and things to pop their tires and break their car down. And he sees this whole area where all the cars have been abandoned and he realized uh, there's trouble ahead. So don't leave the interstate. You leave the interstate, you're going to get eaten by mutants. You leave the Oregon Trail, you're going to be delayed several months and get caught in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. And so uh, Hastings was a guy who created this guidebook, actually, for the Oregon Trail, and he promoted the Hastings Cutoff as this new route. And there were other people promoting the cutoff because they had general stores along the path to be able to sell goods. But it was a horrible route. You would try to go down it, and a lot of it was only navigable by foot. So you would go through, and people were having to cut trees down in order to clear the path for the wagon trains. And then you ended up in the Salt Lake Desert in the middle of summer, and it would slow down the wagon train immensely. And things just went from bad to worse. So by early November, the migrants had reached the Sierra Nevada, but became trapped by an early heavy snowfall. So they almost made it. They almost made it. But the snows decided to come early that year, and they ended up getting snowed in at Truckee Lake, which was later renamed Donner Lake. Uh, Their food supplies ran dangerously low, and in mid-December, some of the group set out on foot to obtain help. Rescuers from California attempted to reach the migrants, but the first relief party did not arrive until the middle of February 1847, almost four months after the wagon train became trapped. Of the 87 members of the party, 48 survived the ordeal. Historians have described the episode as one of the most spectacular tragedies in California history and the entire record of American westward migration. So that is the story of the Donner Party. That's your lesson from the Oregon Trail. Leave at the right time. Don't follow unproven guidebooks. Stay on the trail. When you're traveling cross country, stay on the interstate. Don't try to take some backwoods shortcut or something like that. You're going to end up like the Donner Party or maybe less hilariously uh, National Lampoon's Vacation with Chevy Chase, which is another episode of taking the wrong route with more hilarious results than tragic ones. So, hey, that was fun to talk with you all about the Oregon Trail today. I hope you enjoyed reminiscing about the game and hearing a little about about the real-life Oregon Trail. I'll post links in the description at trendhornpodcast.com if you want to see where you can play Oregon Trail. Uh, also where to read about it and to read uh, the recent book that I mentioned about a gentleman who got a mule team and decided to cross the Oregon Trail today in the same way they did 160 years ago. Uh, And also I'm going to have a bonus for our subscribers at trendhornpodcast.com. A bonus there is that I will upload me playing the Oregon Trail and you can see how I did. After I'm done with this podcast, I'll play the game again and we'll see if I can get to the Willamette Valley or if chance and fate will conspire against me. If you want to watch that as a fun little bonus, check it out at trendhornpodcast.com. And if you want to just support us to help us do more YouTube videos, more podcasts, more debates, more dialogues, be sure to consider supporting us at trendhornpodcast.com. This is a lot of fun today. Hope you have a very blessed day and a very blessed weekend. If you liked today's episode, become a premium subscriber at our Patreon page and get access to member-only content. For more information, visit trendhornpodcast.com.